button when it's red as well.
Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. I may look like Congressman Huffman, but I'm not. You know, I know it's a shock. I'm Congressman Lowenthal, and Congressman Huffman is back in Sonoma dealing with the wildfires that are there and never was able to kind of get back here to Washington. And so uh, we're all hoping that, you know, that, that the fires subside and, uh, and that, you know, m many people are safe and that Mr. Huffman returns soon. So with that, uh, the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on a sea of problems, the impacts of plastic pollution on oceans and wildlife. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements um, at the hearings are limited to the chairman, the ranking minority member, the vice chair, and the vice ranking member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help, keep, uh, help members keep to their schedules. So therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objections, so ordered. I'm going to open up now, and I want to welcome all the witnesses. And today, we're here to discuss a pressing environmental issue and that is plastic pollution. Certainly, single-use plastics have made life easier, but these materials come at a much higher cost than many would like to admit. Plastics last for centuries in the natural environment and are found nearly everywhere on our planet. Last year, I witnessed the impact of plastic pollution on wildlife in Antarctica, one of the few places on Earth that has been relatively untouched by human activity, but certainly not untouched by the scourge of plastics. Personally, I've been involved in trying to tackle the growing plastic crisis for over 20 years, working with my constituent and friend, Captain Charles Moore, who created the scientific research organization Algalita, and who did some of the early uh, research on the plastic garbage gyre. You know, there's an estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic that enter the oceans each year at a rate of about one garbage truck per minute, uh, threatening biodiversity and accumulating in the seafood that we eat and in the water that we drink. Plastics have even been found in water samples right here in the Capitol Visitor Center. Plastics are also making climate change worse. The global life cycle emissions from one year's plastic production throughout the United States are about the same as 462 coal-fired power plants per year, and that number is rising. Plastic production is an environmental justice issue also. Petrochemical factories and incineration facilities are often located in low-income communities, where local health impacts and air quality impacts are quite significant, but frequently are ignored. Finally, in this subcommittee, we need to look at solutions to deal with, for example, ghost fishing gear, fishing gear that's been lost at sea but continues to catch fish, marine mammals, turtles, birds, and corals. It's clear that we need to reduce plastic pollution. Higher recycling commitments and bans and taxes on single-use plastic items can be part of the solution, but we must expand our tools to address this growing environmental and public health problem. In this committee, we switch to reusable pitchers and glasses for water, rather than the disposable plastic water bottles we see so often around the Capitol. But not every switch is as easy, and not everyone has the option. The financial burden of cleaning up pollution should not, be on the, should not be solely on the taxpayers. It's imperative that the companies that manufacture and sell these products take ownership of their environmental impacts. Congress needs to step up. It is for this reason that I've been working on comprehensive legislation with Senator Udall. Our legislation seeks to create a more circular approach by putting in place an extended producer responsibility program, 
implementing recycling content standards, as well as phasing out certain single-use only items that have more sustainable alternatives. I'm excited to announce that we should have a discussion draft of this legislation quite soon, which we will disseminate, disseminate publicly, and I encourage all of you to let me know your thoughts and comments after its release. Some federal agencies are also doing their part. NOAA's Marine Debris Program recently funded 14 new projects addressing aspects of this problem. However, the $2.7 million provided to these projects doesn't even come close to addressing the scale of the ocean plastic problem. The bottom line is this. We need to do more. We need to look at a broader range of solutions that are going to prevent wildlife from being strangled and to keep microplastics from ending up on our plate. With that, I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses about their ideas, and I will now invite the ranking member to share his remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee meets today to hear testimony on plastics and their impact on our oceans. From the tenor of the written testimony, it appears the majority is blaming American consumers for the plastic waste that reaches our oceans and is proposing to place restrictions on them that will dramatically reduce the convenience and higher quality of life that plastics have contributed to our modern society while increasing costs dramatically. Blaming America first seems to be a recurring theme, but the facts paint a very different picture. A 2017 study published in the Environmental Science and Technology magazine found that between 88 and 95 percent of all the plastic debris that enters our oceans comes from 10 rivers, none of which is anywhere close to the United States. Eight of those rivers are in Asia and two are into Africa. According to a 2015 study, the top 20 marine plastic polluters produced as much as 10.76 million metric tons of waterborne plastic debris. The United States generated just 0.11 million metric tons, barely 1%. Indeed, the entire United States contributed less waterborne plastic pollution than North Korea. So who does the majority blame for this? American consumers. But as Dean Kilpatrick once observed, they always blame America first. According to the EPA, <clears throat> Americans have increased plastic recycling from 20,000 tons in 1980 to 3.1 million tons in 2015. That's a 155-fold increase. American consumers go to great lengths to responsibly dispose of plastic waste, and the numbers show that. American consumers are heroes, not villains, in this fight against the plastic pollution of our oceans. We should be celebrating them and not punishing them. Yet that is just what draconian restrictions on plastic use would do, starting with the 1.7 million families who depend on plastics manufacturing to put food on the table, roofs over their heads, and taxes in our government coffers. The single largest state employing them remains my home state of California, where 80,000 Californians are directly employed in the plastics industry. The misplaced object of the left's ire appears to be single-use plastic containers, the toothpaste tube, the shampoo bottle, the plastic bag. They criticize them as wasteful, since plastic is used once and discarded, and yet takes between 50 and 1,000 years to decay. Well, if they are properly disposed of, and Americans do, I have to ask, what exactly is that problem? The most common single-use packaging of the ancient world, once we had progressed from animal skins and gourds, was the amphora, usually a ceramic. A massive hill called Mount Testaccio in Rome is composed of discarded amphorae, which have not degraded in nearly 2,000 years, yet the world is not worse for it, and the Romans were infinitely better off for it. Which begs the question, if we are going to ban single-use plastic containers, exactly what will replace them? How about your toothpaste? Before plastics, toothpaste came in collapsible metal tubes. Do the opponents of plastics find this a more environmentally friendly container? The toothpaste tube was invented to protect consumers from the unhygienic practice of getting toothpaste in glass jars and dipping your toothbrush into them. Shall we return to glass jars? 
Before that, toothpaste came in powder form in cardboard boxes and wax paper, which required mixing a batch every time you wanted to brush your teeth. Plastics have largely replaced aluminum as the best container to protect food against food spoilage. Before aluminum, it was tin. Now, it takes four pounds of bauxite, usually by strip mining, and seven and a half kilowatts of electricity to make one pound of aluminum. Do the plastic critics really think an environmentally friendly alternative is to return to the era of metal containers? Before metal containers, glass was commonly used. Glass takes roughly one million years to decompose, a thousand times longer than the longest estimate for plastic decomposition. I suppose we could go back to cardboard and paper, but I remember the campaign a decade ago to ban paper bags as wasteful and environmentally offensive, so we dutifully replaced them with plastic bags, which have now attracted the ire of the environmental left. Single-use plastics, properly disposed of, mean greater convenience and lower prices for American consumers, and a much smaller environmental footprint than all of the different packaging materials that they have replaced. So I'm very interested in hearing today why Americans, who have an exemplary record of responsible plastic disposal and recycling, are to blame for the excesses of other people in other countries, and why those same Americans should now be punished with higher prices, less convenience, and a lower standard of living. And finally, I'd like to know what are the plastics critics proposing as alternative to plastic containers that they haven't already rejected over the years. Yield back. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that the gentleperson from New Mexico, Representative Holland, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's proceedings. Without objection, that is ordered. Now I'm going to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. Ted Danson. You may know him better as Michael on The Good Place or Sam on Cheers. But Mr. Danson is also the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors at Ocea Oceana, where he has been closely involved since its inception. Our next witness will be Mr. Juan Paris, who is the Founder and Executive Director, of, uh, Director at the Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Service, or Tejas. Following, here, following him, we'll hear from Dr. Jenna Jambeck, Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia and the lead author of a groundbreaking study on plastic. And finally, our last witness will be Tony Radishevsky, who is the President and CEO of the Plastics Industry Association. Let me remind all the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the lights on the witness table will turn green. After four minutes, the yellow light will come on. Your time will have expired when the red light comes on, and I will ask you to please complete your statement. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning witnesses. The chair now recognizes Mr. Danson to testify. Welcome to our committee. I'd like to thank the chair and ranking member and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on plastic pollution. I am the vice chair of Oceana's board of directors. Oceana is the largest international advocacy organization dedicated solely to ocean conservation. I've been working on ocean issues for more than 30 years. In the late 1980s, I co-founded the American Oceans Campaign, which then joined with Oceana in 2002. I'm here to testify today about the growing problem of plastic pollution that is threatening our oceans. Almost from the moment we wake up to the time we go to bed, we're faced with throwaway plastic. We face it when we brush our teeth with a toothbrush made of plastic and squeeze toothpaste out of a plastic tube and when we wash our hair with shampoo and conditioner from plastic bottles. The rest of our daily routines might include one or several coffees and cups with plastic lids, lunch and plastic takeout containers, 
with plastic utensils and grocery shopping where single-use plastic is unavoidable. There isn't a place on Earth untouched by the pollution from all this plastic. The list of marine animals affected by plastic pollution grows. Plastic has been consumed by an estimated 90% of seabird species and eaten by every species of sea turtle. Even our corals are threatened. In addition to polluting the marine environment, plastic poses a risk to human health. We're now seeing plastic in our water, our food, soil, air, and bodies. Plastic particles have been found in everything from honey and beer to salt and tea. Plastic is also affecting our climate. If plastic was a country, it would be the planet's fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases. With plastic production rates anticipated to increase, so will plastic's effects on the climate and oceans. The most important thing to remember about plastic is that it lasts for centuries. This is what makes single-use plastics so profoundly flawed. They're created from a material made to last forever, but are designed to be used once and thrown away. Simply improving recycling rates will not solve the plastic crisis. Of all the plastic waste ever generated, only 9% has been recycled. That means the vast majority was sent to a landfill, incinerated, or ended up polluting our natural environment, including our oceans. Recycling is like trying to mop up water from an overflowing bathtub while the faucet is still running. We need to turn off the faucet and reduce the production of plastic. Companies need to significantly reduce the amount of single-use plastic they are putting onto the market and offer consumers plastic-free choices for their products. Unfortunately, companies aren't doing enough, and that's why we need your help. Policies governing the production and use of single-use plastic are effective, and these policies are becoming more common around the world and across this country. The European Union, Peru, Chile, and Canada have all announced or are implementing policies to reduce plastic pollution. U.S. cities, counties, and states have taken the initiative passing policies to reduce single-use plastics. But ultimately, comprehensive U.S. federal action is needed. This committee should use its authority to tackle the problem. I applaud you for stopping the use of plastic water bottles in committee hearings. The National Park Service had a policy to encourage national parks to stop selling water in plastic bottles. Unfortunately, the policy has been reversed. The committee should make our national parks, wildlife refuges, marine sanctuaries, and other federal lands and waters into single-use plastic-free zones. I urge Congress to pass federal legislation that stops plastic pollution at the source, that significantly reduces the production of this everlasting pollutant, and that holds cor corporations responsible for this global crisis and enable states and cities to continue to lead the way on solutions. Don't fall for the false promise of recycling. And please don't stoop to incineration. We must stop the runaway increase in plastic production and reduce the amount of plastic that companies are making and foisting on us because it will last for centuries. We have no more time to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Danson. The chair now recognizes Mr. Paris uh, to testify for five minutes. Welcome to the committee. <clears throat> I, too, thank you, Chairman Mr. Lowenthal and Ranking Member Mackling Touch. I am Juan Paras with Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services. Texas has, has been working on environmental justice issues along the Houston Ship Channel for over 16 years. We work at the intersection of human rights and social justice issues. We call Houston home and share that home with the largest petrochemical complex in the nation, the second largest in the world. It is also the largest city with no zoning, meaning that refineries and petrochemical plants, storage tanks, and other industries and infrastructures can be built on the fence line of communities bordering them. 99% of plastic is derived from fossil fuels. 
of those plastics produced, they are derived from either frack gas or oil. The explosion of natural gas products has led to an ever-increasing demand for natural gas liquid, rich in the chemicals that serve as the building block of plastic production. Napthal is a product of oil refining. It is another key of element of plastic production. Only five companies account for over half of global napalm sales. British BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, and China National Petroleum Corporation. Four of the five have refining capacities along our coast within an hour of our front door communities. We are already exposed to a dangerous mix of toxic pollutants, both authorized and unauthorized, released by many different industrial sources located along the Houston Ship Channel. Over the last several years, that petrochemical complex has been expanding. Post Hurricane Harvey, we began tracking emissions and realized that the expansions hidden in our communities were related to a rapidly and ever-growing market in plastics. Ethane crackers, terminals, and logistics plants all centered around one thing, the production of plastics. We understood that this expansion is focused on ethylene crackers and LNG facilities. However, we now understand the major economic pivotal oil and gas is undergoing, shifting from traditional production into new forms of petroleum utilization. However, as they expand, so too did the instability of these petrochemical plants, and we have seen an increase of chemical disasters in the Houston Ship Channel. In most recent fires, 37 people were injured, some with first-degree burns, Workers were initially evacuated, but, but later required to re-enter the plant as the fire was still burning. To compound the problems, the, commissioners, the commission's Baytown air quality monitors had malfunctioned during the event and thus deprived community members of invaluable air quality data to protect their health. While those fires placed, community members were wholly unaware of the fire or proper shelter in place. ExxonMobil has a 10-year investment of $20 billion in their in in their expansions projects for the Gulf of Texas. Recent disasters, the ExxonMobil fire on March the 16th, 2019, the ITC fire on March the 17th, 2019, where over eight cities were held hostage under a chemical plume 47 miles long and 17 miles wide. The ExxonMobil Olafine fire on July the 31st, 2019, where 37 workers were injured. And on September the 20th, 2019, where nine chemical barges collided after a tropical, tropical storm and melted damaged evacuation routes. In a recent report for the Center for International Environmental Law found that if trends in the oil consumption continue as expected, the consumption of, of oil by the entire plastic sector will account for 20% of the total consumption by 2050. A recent study uncovered two-thirds of the 90 plastic-related facilities in the Houston region violated air pollution control laws, laws over the last five years and were subject to inf environmental enforcements. But many more exceeded their permits and were not penalized, state records show. This compounding emissions result in cumulative impacts on neighboring communities, including an increased risk for developing cancer and other health conditions. Uh, plastic poses a distinct risk to public health and well heads to the waste. From our dinner table to the depths of our ocean, every part of the chain that creates plastic harms us. Plastic is being produced near vulnerable communities, predominantly people of color, poor people, indigenous, and immigration, and immigrant people who have to pay the price and short, shortening the lifespan of our children and elderly. And I'll see then I'm out of time, but I will submit the entire document. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paris. The chair now recognizes Dr. Jambeck to testify for five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Jambeck. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal and Ranking Member McClintock um, and the rest of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here to testify at this hearing. My name is Jenna Jambeck. I'm a professor of environmental engineering at the University of Georgia and a National Geographic Fellow. I've been conducting research on solid waste for over 23 years with related projects on marine debris itself for 18, especially projects regarding location and spatial analysis, quantification and characterization, and global plastic waste management. 
I've also witnessed and sampled plastic in the ocean sailing across the Atlantic in 2014. I've co-developed the mobile litter logging app Marine Debris Tracker, which was funded by the NOAA Marine Debris Program in 2011, where over two million items have been logged by people all over the world. I've previously testified to the Senate on this issue to the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife. I'm also a participant in the International Informational Speakers Program with the U.S. State Department. This has brought me to uh, 13 different countries and economies around the world to engage with uh, governments, academics, NGOs, and citizens on this issue. I've submitted a longer written document, but my testimony today is my opinion based upon my background and experience conducting research on marine debris, plastic, and waste. When I testified previously to Congress in 2016, I spoke to educate and raise awareness of this issue based upon my research, but we now know we have a major problem with plastic ending up in our environment and in the ocean. The science on this issue has increased rapidly just in the past four years. We now know we've produced 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic as of 2017, and since about 40% of this is used for packaging and single-use items, it means that 6.3 billion of that had become waste by 2015. So what have we done with that waste? How did we manage it? Um, we've recycled about 9% of that cumulatively. Those vary locally. Um, but on average, globally, recycled only about 9%. Another 12% had been incinerated, and so that means 79% has ended up either in a landfill or in the open environment. So as a result of weathering and exposure to sunlight, plastic that's in the environment doesn't biodegrade. It simply fragments into smaller and smaller pieces, and with an unknown fate, I would say, of the smallest particles that we can't even measure yet. So you heard the number in our science paper in 2015. We estimated the global quantity of plastic entering the oceans at 8 million metric tons uh, in 2010, and that's equal to about a dump truck of plastic entering every minute. So although there have been actions taken globally to stop the business-as-usual production projection of this input doubling by 2025, plastic production use and population growth are all driving factors that have resulted in an increase of plastic use and in our waste streams. So we can all agree we want to keep plastic out of the ocean in the first place. There's a tremendous opportunity for continued bipartisan support and action on this issue. In the intervention framework I developed in 2016, we start all the way upstream with reducing waste generation, especially in places with high per person waste generation rates. Like here in the USA, our waste generation rate is two to six times that of many countries around the world, especially still economically developing countries. And this reduction can be uh, obtained through a combination of individual choice, policies, and industry-led changes. For when we do need packaging, there needs to be a more distinct connection between design, material choice, and end-of-life management of materials. Currently, the waste management system has to deal with whatever comes their way. This is one contributing factor to the historical practice of exporting nearly 50% of our plastic recycling to other countries, primarily those of lower income, which contributes to the environmental pollution in their country as well. Engagement of all stakeholders across all points of this issue from production to use to management is critical to make sure all voices are heard. And so one reminder I always have to give, there are people behind all the numbers I gave you, and so we need to collectively come up with creative, socially and culturally appropriate solutions because we're all here today presenting to you. I am optimistic we can do that, and I will continue to work hard on science to inform policy, but everyone has an important role to play. So in my last points, I want to encourage you to try two experiments. First, uh, for the next 24 hours, take note of everything that you touch that is plastic. From this, you will see how widely used and useful the material is, but it also makes you reflect upon where and when are the right times and places to use this material. Second, go outside on a scavenger hunt for litter. You won't likely have to go far and look at each item you find as a message for you the figurative, or sometimes literal, message in a bottle. Ask yourself three questions. One, what is it? Two, how did it get here? And three, what are we going to do about it? Community-based data collection and citizen science within a framework and structure can contribute to critical data needed to inform circular materials management in communities. And I believe, and questions like these can empower citizens, NGOs, corporations, and policymakers like you to take the most relevant and impactful action for their country, state, or community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jambeck. The chair now recognizes Tony 
Radishevsky to testify. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Radishevsky. Good afternoon, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Men Member McClintock, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Tony Radishevsky, and I am the President and CEO of the Plastics Industry Association. We call ourselves Plastics for short, and we use that term proudly. Plastics were first developed by John Wesley Hyde in the 19th century as a synthetic replacement for billiard balls. Yes, that's right, billiard balls. Ivory was expensive, and the process of collecting it was gruesome and inhumane. So Hyatt tinkered around in his lab and developed a material that could behave like ivory, but at a fraction of the cost and at a fraction of the environmental impact. That's been the story of plastics from their genesis to today. It's a material that meets or exceeds the performance of other materials and does so at a fraction of the cost and with lower environmental impact. Since they were first developed, plastics have grown to make hospitals safer, surgeries less invasive, patient care more sterile, safer, effective, and affordable. In the century and a half since they were invented, plastics have also made cars, trucks, and planes more efficient, more affordable, more environmentally friendly, and ultimately safer. Plastic pipe brings fresh water to people and takes wastewater away for treatment in the most economical and environmentally sustainable way. Plastics have, have, plastics have also made food last longer, improving health and safety to millions across the world. The plastics industry employs 993,000 people in the United States. The state with the largest number of plastics employees is California where 79,700 men and women are directly employed by our industry. I can say with confidence that none of them got into this business in order to pollute our oceans and waterways. I can also say with confidence that many of them entered the industry with a passion to improve the safety and quality of a lot of people. That our products end up where they shouldn't upsets me, and I'm sure every one of those nearly one million people who work in this industry feel the same way. But it's a fact. It's also a fact that a staggering 8 million tons of plastic ends up in the world's ocean each year, 90% of which originates from 10 rivers in Southeast Asia and Africa. The remaining 10% comes from elsewhere around the world. That's a great deal of value being wasted when these products end up in lakes, rivers, and ultimately oceans. Our industry agrees with everyone in this room that there is a plastic waste problem. The urgency of the situation cries out for a solution more thoughtful than simply say no to a material that lowers greenhouse gas emissions, is more efficient to produce than other materials like metal, paper, and glass, and has delivered numerous benefits to society as a whole. Study after study, including one conducted recently by the California Water Board, has shown that banning a plastic product simply drives consumers to other less sustainable materials. Bans have a very minor impact on litter if they have any impact at all. Plastics are used in such a diverse array of applications because they are the best option when all considerations are evaluated. In a free market society, consumers decide which products provide the best value and performance. In so many applications, the chief characteristics of plastics, that is their lower weight, durability, flexibility, and versatility, constantly make them superior to other competing materials. Plastic bags became popular due to concerns about how many trees were being cut down to make paper bags. Plastic bottles are lighter and don't break as easily as glass ones, reducing product loss and shipping costs. When they're disposed of properly, these plastic products have a smaller environmental footprint than identical products made of other materials. Rather than trying to deny the value of plastics, we need to head in the opposite direction and aim to preserve and enhance their value so that they're worth too much to waste. This can happen by investing in recycling and waste management infrastructure. We continue to support legislation that will provide grants through the Environmental Protection Agency to state and local entities to improve recycling infrastructure, which is what we need to close the loop on these issues. We've also supported the Save Our Seas 2.0 Act, which aims to improve efforts to combat marine debris and is currently seeing action in various Senate committees, with companion legislation having been introduced here in the House. The industry itself has stepped up to this challenge by innovating like it always has, developing new chemistries, investing in new recycling and collection technologies, developing ways to convert plastic waste into energy and, and creating the supply to meet the demand for recycled plastic content. Still, we need the support of federal, state, and local authorities to ensure that no American has to wonder if the bottle they toss in the blue bin will end up being recycled or if it will end up as landfill fodder. Perhaps I should sum up our industry's position with a recent quote from Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Quote, we shouldn't treat plastic as an enemy nor ostracize those who use it. What's needed is appropriate management of trash and to search for solutions through innovation, end quote. On a personal note, I love this industry. I've worked for it for nearly 40 years. I, I sincerely believe that plastics are among humankind's greatest innovations and that they've delivered an enormous benefit to public health and commerce all over the world. 
We need to learn, to, to, to learn, we need to learn how to live with these materials because I can assure you we would never want to have to live without them. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Testimony, Mr. Radishevsky. Um, reminding, I'm going to remind the members of the committee that Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions, that you, and now the chairman is going to recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask members of the panel or the witnesses, and I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes of questions. And so my first question goes to Dr. Jambeck, and I want to follow up on something you've said, but also something that the ranking member spoke about in his introduction, where he said there is no real problem here in the United States. The real m amount of, of plastics that in the ocean really come from other countries, Asian countries and African countries. So Dr. Jambeck, you've all, you know in your work how much of the waste is entering the oceans from China, Vietnam, and other Southeastern Asia countries. Can you tell us, is this the real picture of the origins of the waste? Uh, can you tell us more about the full impact of the United States' role in contributing to oceans debris uh, and plastic weight, and has that been partially hidden by our reliance on exporting our waste to, uh, primarily to Asia? Can you? kind of give us, respond to that. That's really how it was framed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's a big question. But certainly when we first did those calculations of the global input of plastic into the ocean, um, we couldn't take into account that import-export aspect. And so what, what we did see were these influencing factors, so really rapidly developing economies where infrastructure to manage the waste that comes with the increased waste generation that comes with economic growth, um, that infrastructure was lagging behind. So um, the areas that have been referred to here, so many of those rapidly developing economies is where we saw the most leakage. But as I mentioned in my testimony, our per person waste generation rate is two to six times that within the US. And if we look at leakage as a percentage of what we generate, um, the reason the US is only the, high, the only high income country within the top 20 countries within that original paper is because of our waste generation rates. So in terms of um, a contribution to the global plastic quantity of waste, the 6.4 million that I mentioned, or billion, excuse me, um, we are a major contributor. So what has become uh, an issue that started in the 90s in terms of our single stream recycling to make it easier, we can put everything in one bin. Um, that meant our commodities as well as the WTO encouraging global trade um, and China needing material for manufacturing becoming the manufacturing hub of the world, that set up um, this rapid increase in, in, in exporting of our recycled materials. And for me, we looked at recycled plastic. So over half of that had been going to China until they stopped that um, in the end of 2017, which caused a cascade impact on a recycle industry within the US itself. And so that's been a major problem because we were relying on lower income countries to manage that material. In many cases, with um, China having trouble managing their own and then us exporting on top of that. So that contributes to pollution in those countries as well. So it's, a, it's very interconnected and complex, but I hope that clarifies some. Thank you. I want to talk a little, raise some questions about, all right, we know about the, the uh, uh, waste and of, of plastics and, their, um, and how much it going into the ocean, but the question is, how does this impact species? So, so the first question is, we've just had the, we see the IPBES, I think, I hope that I pronounced it right, a report that was released earlier this year that included plastic pollution as a threat to marine uh, biodiversity. So it's seen as a threat. The first question is, do you know, Mr. Danson, if plastic is affecting species that are in danger of extinction. What is, we're trying to understand not only how it gets into the ocean, but what some of the impacts are. Uh, some of the impacts, uh, turtles, every species of turtles is uh, either on the endangered species list or close to. And every species of turtle has ingested plastic 
Uh, plastic doesn't go away completely. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So a turtle or a sea mammal or another fish may ingest uh, that plastic. They think that they are full because their stomachs are full of plastic, so they stop eating and they starve to death. Um, albatross uh, end up dipping into what they think is a uh, sea urge, um, um, sorry, some sort of uh, something they like to eat in the water, but it's plastic, then they feed it to their their child, their little bird, and the bird dies for the same reason, they starve to death. So yes, it's having an impact on whales, on many species. Thank you, I think my time has been up, and so I'm going to yield, uh, call upon uh, Representative Graves, who looked very good sitting on the Democratic side there for a while, and we welcome him back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've recruited a number of your members to come to our side. Are and, you coming uh, to my district this weekend? I'm going to recruit I am. you. I, I look so forward to, uh, and, I, and I want to make note, uh, Mr. Lowenthal and I, the, um, I, I, I was arguing with him a while back, and I said, you need to come see what it, the people that I represent, the communities that I represent, um, so you understand why I, I say the things that I do and why mm -hmm. I vote the way that I do. And to his credit, he came down and spent three days in Louisiana and put him on a boat, an airboat, uh, we put you on an airplane or helicopter maybe, uh, took him all over the place, made him eat crawfish, um, all sorts of things, uh, plastic-free crawfish. Um, and, uh, and so I do want to thank you, and I'm looking forward to going over to, to your part of the country. To, it's going to be great. To see if um, we can talk some wisdom into those people. But so, now you uh, have to ask questions. <laughs> now you have, you have five minutes. Thank you. No, seriously, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate the, the friendship. and. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to meet with some of your constituents. Um, hey, thank you all very much for being here, and, and I want to be clear that um, I, I very much appreciate all of your efforts to remove plastic from the waste stream, a goal that, that, that I very much share and represent um, uh, part of the coast of Louisiana and uh, one of the top commercial and recreational fishing uh, destinations and, and producers in the, in the United States. And, and not just fishing for fun, but, but for subsistence and a really important part of our culture, community, economy in, uh, in South Louisiana. Um, look, we can talk in game for a minute, but I'm, I'm curious. Um, there's a, there's a, a huge part of the waste stream that exists right now. Uh, you, you've got plastic in the oceans. You've got plastic that is um, uh, somewhere in the recycle chain, as we know, with what China has done. What, what, what do we do right now, just, just putting the long term aside, looking at the incredible waste streams that are in the ocean, and, and I'm well aware and supportive of, of some of the uh, legislation that we've pushed out of the House uh, to deal with that, but what do we do with the, the, the current waste stream of plastic. So the current uh, uh, waste stream that is uh, supposed to be recycled, but with the China ban has created some problems with where it goes. What do we do with the, the, the plastic that's in the ocean? If you were king for the day, could make any decision, what, what would you do? Uh, Mr. Danson, starting, I'd like to ask all your opinions. I would reduce single-use plastic. It's designed to be, to live forever, and yet you use it once and throw it away. If you do take can, the easy things like that that can, aren't really can, necessary. Can, can I just clarify my question, though? So my, my point is, though, is you've got plastic that's already been singularly used. And so it's already somewhere in the waste stream, whether it is in our oceans, it's somewhere in the, in the, in the um, shipping, or somewhere where it's going to be recycled. But it's somewhere in the waste stream already. Well, how, how do we handle that waste stream? I'm not sure. If it's in the ocean, I'm not sure you can. Uh, it's like oil. Once it's in the water column, you're not going to get it out. You may be able to scoop some of the obvious bigger pieces out. You can do beach cleanup and all of that. But really, compared to the amount of plastic that's about to be produced in the next 20, 30 years, it's going to be scaled up. There's, it's, you just can't compete with the amount of plastic production by recycling and picking up on the beaches. Thank you. Mr. Pars? What I see in our neighborhoods and communities all over the country is that plastic is actually made to be disposable, it seems like. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's affordable because it is plastic, so what happens is that people just don't consider it as trash or as valuable, so they get rid of it. And until we start actually either charging more for the production of plastics so that we can have major cleanups that may help. 
Thank you. And, and uh, Dr. Jembeck, and I just I want to reemphasize, I'm talking about the, the, the existing load that, that's there, uh, and, and I'm interested to hear um, our last witness talk a little bit about some of the technologies moving forward, but please. Sure. So quickly, uh, what's already in existence, probably the easiest thing to grab are nets, so something that your area is well familiar with, and they are one of the materials, typically nylon, very valuable, and could be recycled. Um, the problem with what already exists is the diversity of plastic that, that's there, the challenges um, with recycling that, so most of it is getting um, landfilled here in the U.S., um, and so that's not the best thing. We wish that it, more of it could be recycled. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today, our industry, the four value components of our value chain from the ma resin manufacturers, the machinery manufacturers, processors, and end users are all actively engaged in recycling and reuse of these products, ranging from uh, sorting to the plastics that are num uh, most predominantly used in recycling, PET and high-density polyethylene, and then also developing technologies that can sort out the other materials and, and develop enough of a waste stream so that they can be used in applicable uh, applications. Um, the other technologies that are being used right now are chemical recycling, in uh, which we can take the products back to their basic form, repolymerize it, and use it again in food contact packaging, where before, if it's recycled, we can't use it in food packaging. So these are technologies that we're actively involved in right now. Thank you. Uh, you'll back. Thank you, and I now recognize Representative uh, Case for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, the ranking member asked uh, two, um, I think, good questions. Uh, the first is that he asked, what exactly is the problem? And the second question that he asked was, uh, why should Americans uh, take the blame for the excesses of the rest of the world? Those are two good questions in this debate. Um, as to the first question, give a couple of examples from my perspective. Uh, in the state of Hawaii, we have the largest marine monument in our country, Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument, and there we get somewhere around 52 metric tons of marine debris, almost all ghost fishing gear every year, every year. Now, why is that a problem? Well, it wrecks coral reefs, which are endangered around the world, uh, and it, uh, it, it degrades into smaller parcels, which then are ingested by our marine life. Um, we have 1,400 Hawaiian monk seals left in the entire world and declining. Uh, they get entrapped in this debris and die. Uh, that species is highly endangered. Um, we have uh, invasive species from elsewhere in the world uh, hitching a ride on ghost fishing gear to Hawaii, the, the, the uh, endangered species capital of the world, where we cannot take that kind of external um, uh, impact. Um, we have in Hawaii, I, I went on uh, the first, uh, the first uh, World Reef Day on Ju June 1st of this year uh, to the north shore of, of Oahu to a beach in Kahuku, uh, where I tried to clean up a coastline with the Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, one of many grassroots organizations across our country, trying to do something about it on a micro level. Um, a beach that I used to walk on that was pretty white uh, is now um, all different colors, green, yellow, red, very small particles of plastics, not degraded, but down into the level of ingestion at the very lowest levels of marine life. Now that's what the problem is. Now, as to the ranking member's second question, uh, why should we take the hit when the rest of the world isn't doing anything about it? I think that's a really legitimate question because it reminds me greatly of the debate over climate change where essentially uh, the same uh, question is posed. Uh, why should we reduce our emissions when the rest of the world is not doing that? And that leads us to international agreements as what I can see as being one of the only ways to get at this problem from an inter international perspective. So, you know, uh, Mr. Danson, um, does Oceana uh, partner with international organizations towards an international solution uh, to plastics in the ocean uh, given that, um, it does put us at a disadvantage uh, for us to unilaterally uh, curb our plastics use uh, from several perspectives, and yet we need to do it. Uh, cities and counties and states throughout the country are doing that. The city and county of Honolulu is doing it right now. Um, are you partnering with the rest of the world to try to find those international agreements? Yes, I believe we are. I think, we're, I think there are literally thousands, or at least a thousand uh, groups around the world working on plastics. This is a united effort. Um, I can get you more specifics when I talk to the staff of Oceana. Um, 
I mean, we haven't talked about climate change and greenhouse gases, but plastic is such a huge uh, part of that story. Um, I, I don't see how we can not address our plastic, our greenhouse gas emissions and without, and if we don't do that, how we expect the rest of the world to follow along. So, yeah, that's, sorry. That's okay, right. thank you very much. Mr. Ratajewski, um, you stated in your testimony that uh, you are supportive of, uh, you and your industry are supportive of Save Our Oceans 2.0, which is a bipartisan uh, bill introduced, bicameral bill introduced in both the House and the Senate, and that calls for uh, much greater studies, some incentives at the federal level, but it also calls for pursuing um, international agreements that would curb plastic use, especially single use plastic use around the world. Uh, and I just want to, that, your testimony sounded to be inconsistent with that position, that part of Save Our Oceans 2.0. Are you supportive of pursuing international agreements whereby the entire world uh, would agree to a reduction in plastic use and a reduction of dumping of plastics into the oceans? I would say we are involved and in, in eagerly uh, working with international organizations to find solutions to the problems that exist today. We are engaged with, uh, the, whether it's the British Plastics Union, the Canadian Plastics Union, uh, in Industry Association, the New Zealand Plastics Association, working in consortium with them to define those uh, uh, abilities to, to minimize the waste in, in the ocean and in the land as well. Okay, so um, that doesn't sound like what, what I'm talking about. It sounds like you're working with the rest of the plastics industry around the world uh, to manage um, it going into the oceans, but not necessarily reducing it. Reducing or reusing or recycling, there's a lot of different options that we're looking at and in, in the Save Our Seas 2.0, there are many parts of it that we do like and other parts that we would still like to negotiate with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I recognize the ranking member for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I don't think Mr. Case was listening very carefully to what I said. I was referring specifically to properly disposed of plastics, plastics put in landfills, incinerated or recycled, none of which gets into the ocean. And we know that uh, America counts for less than 1% of plastic marine pollution. So even if we went to the extreme of banning all plastics in the United States, in, effect, in, in addition to having a devastating effect on the economy, it would at best affect just 1% of plastic pollution in our oceans. But Mr. Radoshevsky, uh, Dr. Jambeck asked a very uh, uh, intriguing question. Think about how much plastic you touch every day. Isn't that an indication of how useful plastic has become in our daily lives? Absolutely. If you look at what plastics have replaced in the past, whether it's glass, paper, steel, aluminum, the reason why there is so much plastic is it is the best choice in terms of many of the packaging applications that isn't, finds itself isn't in. Isn't her question also a warning of how our quality of life would decline if the left is successful in uh, restricting or banning it? Well, I would think a lot of things that we've taken for granted today would be gone, and the accessibility to uh, those foodstuffs that give us a higher quality of life, not only to uh, uh, Americans on the east and west coast, but in the middle of the country in poor, poor areas as well. The availability to get foods, foods to uh, different parts of the world because of lower transportation costs and the food stays safer uh, and healthier and fresher are all reasons why the quality of life, not only in the United States, but across the world has increased. I think Dr. Jambeck's question also begs a correlate question. Let's think about everything that we touch every single day. Everything is either mined or it is grown, is it not? I would think that'd be right. I, I don't know of a single exception to that. Uh, and, and that then opens a new question, and that is, well, what's the alternative? to plastics. I, I, I use the example of the toothpaste tube. What would be the alternative to that? Well, and, and, and I think even in your original testimony, you mentioned what it used to be. And as far as we know, the only thing we could go was go back to what it was. And so that would mean glass bottles. That would mean uh, a, a lead, I think, was what it was once used in toothpaste tubes uh, because of the softness of it. So there's, you know, if you go backwards, you're, you're talking about materials that have a higher carbon footprint, take more energy to produce, usually way more, so the transportation costs also increase, so you have that aspect as well. So at this juncture in our technology and science and, and, and advancement of our civilization, plastics are the most environmentally friendly 
alternative that we have if we are to uh, uh, engage in the commerce that makes our civilization possible, is it not? I think that's very right. In, in fact, again, I go back to the point of uh, just let's look at food packaging, the ability to get uh, bratwurst at any place in the country at any time because it's wrapped in plastic and has a, a, a foam, styre, a foam uh, board pack in it, which is made of styrene. Is, makes it accessible to everybody. Your meat stuff, uh, your sausage con containers for your breakfast patties, all those are packaged in plastics because they get product to the shelf economically, safely, and fresh. I, I'm curious, Mr. Danson, uh, how are we going to get our toothpaste, for example? How do you propose that we, uh, we can package our toothpaste in the future? You want to ban plastic containers? You want to go back to metal tubes or glass jars? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? There is, you, you have not, I've not heard a single alternative uh, offered by the critics of plastics. Uh, and I think it's become very clear that plastics, we have found to be a far better solution economically and environmentally uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the, the materials that we have used in the past. Uh, Mr. Radishevsky, tell me how a ban on single-use plastics would impact the overall economy. I think it'd be detrimental to it. Uh, it could have an effect uh, of, of putting people out of work. Uh, I don't think there's a quick response to, to supply the demand that the marketplace has created for these products. So you'd have a shortage of goods. Uh, you would have an economic decline because of lack of innovation of, of materials that we're seeing in the plastics industry. So there's a, there's a whole host of things that would be affected immediately with what, some of these immediate what, 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 And What would happen to consumer prices? Well, they would go up. I mean, it's a simple example of supply and demand. If the demand is, is not satisfied by the well, supply, the price Our, our automobiles, for example, instead of using uh, plastic materials, would go back to using metal materials. I mean, I'm just looking at these nameplates right here. They're plastic. In, in a previous day, they were brass. Much more expensive uh, and, uh, and much harder on the environment to, to mine. Is that correct? It is. And one of the, in fact, if you look at the CAFE standards, one of the reasons the automobile industry has been to make to be able to meet those standards uh, over the last couple of decades is because of the incorporation of, of higher performing plastics that do the so, same performance as metal. So, but so once weights. again, it's, it's blame America first. Let's harm the American consumer, even though the American consumer is responsibly disposing of plastic products uh, and uh, with, without any alternative. That to me sounds almost childlike. Uh, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. I now call upon Mr. Cunningham, Representative Cunningham, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and thank you for holding this hearing today on an issue that's near and dear to, to my heart and uh, also our constituents uh, in the 1st District of South Carolina, which stretches uh, from Charleston all the way down to, to Hilton Head. Uh, this issue is certainly on the minds of South Carolinians. Uh, many of whom dedicate their free time to support local beach cleanups uh, in an effort to preserve our beautiful, God-given natural resources. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud uh, to represent so many of these conservation leaders. Um, the local uh, Surfrider Foundation chapter in my congressional district hosts beach cleanups almost every single weekend. And we also have uh, Andrew uh, Wonderly, the uh, Charleston waterkeeper, who has made it his livelihood to protect and restore the quality of Charleston's waterways uh, while fighting for the right to uh, swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. And uh, today, I actually um, came up here from um, Charleston with uh, some of the plastic treasures that were uh, recently found on our shoreline over the weekend uh, from the Goose Creek uh, Reservoir, which is the source of uh, the Goose Creek water supply. So let's see what we got here today. Um, that was, and this is just found this weekend. Um, looks like we've got a used piece of styrofoam here. Uh, we've got a plastic water bottle here. Single use straw. Um, you know, a single use plastic bag and this this actually looks like it's been kind of shredded or nibbled on, uh, more than likely ingested by some type of marine life. Uh, so this is what's, what's left of it right now. Um, some other straws, a shredded straw here. That we, we've all seen the pictures um, of sea turtles ingesting these and the damage that causes. Um, glass jar 
and a, uh, looks like a potato chip bag, plastic. Um, and you know, this isn't, this isn't abnormal, unfortunately. This has become kind of the norm of what washes up on our shorelines or into our waterways every single weekend, and a lot of people in this room are aware of it. Um, and in fact, earlier this year, NOAA published a report on the economic impacts of marine debris. And I, I would like to, um, without objection, I would like to enter this report for the record. Um, not surprisingly, this report found that getting rid of debris from our beaches can have a significant positive impact on the tourism economy. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, Mr. Danson, um, every year the Ocean Conservancy's International Coastal Cleanup Report shows the most frequently found items on the beach. In 2017, data showed for the first time that the top 10 most commonly found items were all made of plastic. And that trend continued in 2018. Uh, so Mr. Danson, what, what, what items is what you saw here today? Is this typical of, of the items typically found in, in beach cleanups in your experience? And, and how does this uh, these discoveries help shape policy? Well, they're all single-use plastics, which is something we would like to reduce. Uh, they're all very convenient and easy for us to use in our everyday life, but create incredible problems, everything from greenhouse gases to sea animals dying from ingesting it. Um, so it's, that's our disposable lifestyle, of which I am part of. It's very hard to deal with that. Um, every day, but people are coming up with solutions. There's a toothpaste called Bite that now comes in a little jar that's a powder and you add water there, that creates jobs and money uh, and taxes. So there are alternatives that we need to find. It's been incredibly useful and now it's become incredibly dangerous and I think that's the argument, not that uh, the left or the right has any monopoly on uh, you know, being smart about things. It's, this is a problem for all of us, and we all need to find ways to do it. And I do believe we are capable of that. I appreciate it, Mr. Dancy, and I appreciate you all being here today. Um, unfortunately, my, my time is coming to a close, but, you know, I know there's been some discussion here today as far as where the United States is, as far as uh, the polluting and cleanup and everything, but I think we should all agree that uh, the United States of America is a leader, and we should lead on this issue, and, we'll, and no matter where we fall in the list of polluters, uh, you know, we should be leading by example and, um, you know, being more responsible, being more of like a, a Sam instead of the norm, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you will. Um, but, but just, uh, you know, being out in, the, out in the front on this and recognizing that this, this is not sustainable, and we have to do every single thing in our power uh, to make that come to an end. So I appreciate what the work you all are doing. appreciate the time here today, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. And I now recognize Congressman Sablan for five minutes of question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. Um, in my first few months here in Congress, in my first year, I had this naive thought if there was a possibility for some committee members to get on an airplane and fly over this garbage patch that's in the Pacific. And now it has a new name, actually. It's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And it's located just a little north of Hawaii. And um, right next to a place called Micronesia. Well, I come from the Northern Marianas, which comes, which is a part of Micronesia, called Micronesia, because it's a, a lot of small islands together. And you take all of those islands together, and to all of them, and put them together, and it's hardly a large part of this garbage patch. We have in the Northern Mariana Islands that are conservation islands, and unless you're a scientist with a permit, you can't get on these islands. But there have been scientists who have got permits and gotten on and found to their dismay that they had to collect bags and bags and bags and bags of garbage, plastic garbage. 
Um, I don't mean any disrespect to all of you. Thank you, um, Mr. Danson. Sir, thank you very much for so many, between you, your cheers and mash, I had so many wonderful hours of great entertainment. I enjoyed your show, cheers. I also noticed among the four witnesses on the table, sir, uh, Mr. Radawas, Rado, uh, Rados. That's okay, you... call me Tony, how about that? Okay, Tony. Among all the four witnesses, you're the only one with a plastic bottle of water. Right. Yeah, I mean, you really are for your product. Um, yeah, I... Uh, so if you would like me to comment on that, I've No, been, I'm okay. not asking okay. you for a comment. I'm just an observation, sir. Uh, you, you don't have to bring that because there are glasses of water in front of you. But you see, these Micronesian islands, yeah, we probably contributed to some of this debris, but we're not responsible for that debris, and that thing is floating and growing, and it's one day going to cover Micronesia. Uh, Micronesia is, the area is the size of the 48 contiguous states. And uh, so what do we do about that? I mean, you know, uh, Professor, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Janbeck, how much effort and resource would you think it would take to clean up this garbage patch? So, what is floating out there is only about 3% of what we think is going in every year. So it's not a large amount, but you're absolutely right in that what is floating often ends up on islands like yours that sort of interrupt those currents. Um, to be honest, the best way to sort of get that out is if it's ending up on land um, and up. then cleaning that land like they do in Hawaii. Um, you know, getting, there are folks who are trying to design systems to collect out in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but it, there's a lot of resources that go into that, and that is similar to the analogy of mopping up your bathroom floor while the tap is on. Okay, I mean, just imagine what it'd be like for Hawaii if those garbage get any closer and just keep going on land, and because tourists is their major industry. Um, I, I don't have an answer to the problem, I really don't. I do have a serious concern because, uh, you know, I eat a lot of fish, uh, reef caught fish and tuna caught by trolling and everything, and um, I agree that, um, you know, these things get into the fish, and so it gets into what I eat, probably in most likelihood, but I, I don't know, I don't have an answer. I'm not as smart as the four of you sitting at the witness table or those people who aren't, but we do need to take something, act and get something going and trying to find a way to resolve this and maybe find an alternative to plastic. Um, that's not going to hurt people's jobs, you know? Uh, there has to be something. We're, we're, we're a much better nation than we think we are, than we give ourselves credit for. My time is up, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sablan. Uh, next for, we, I, the chair recognizes Mr. Negus for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for hosting this important hearing. Uh, the topic of plastic in our waters and oceans cannot be more pressing. A study conducted by the U.S. Department of the Interior and the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, aptly and alarmingly called It's Raining Plastic, was published in May and found that plastic was found in 90% of rainfall samples in Denver and in Boulder, Colorado, uh, which happened to be um, Boulder in particular, the area that I represent in Congress, amongst many others. An earlier study found that people are swallowing an average of five grams of plastic every week, about the weight of a credit card. For my constituents who are suffering from this reality every day, uh, ultimately, for the people across this nation and the world who are doing the same, it is imperative that we address this issue. Uh, it just happens, Mr. Chair, uh, quite fittingly, uh, literally, one week ago, or a week and a half ago, on October 16th of 2019, a constituent of mine, her name is Annie, she's a sophomore at Fort Collins Polaris Expeditionary Learning School in my district, wrote to me about this very issue, about the issue of microplastics in our world's oceans and water systems at large. And in her letter, she said, I'm such a small part of this world, but I want to do everything I can 
to fix this problem. Uh, I am certainly inspired by her uh, commitment to fixing this problem and am heartened uh, by uh, the chairman's decision to host this important hearing and, and my fellow committee members uh, in their attempt to address this issue collectively and, of course, to the witness witnesses who've uh, joined us into their testimony. Um, I will confess I, I had a number of uh, uh, competing uh, scheduling uh, commitments uh, from uh, both a hearing perspective as well as meetings, uh, but I was watching the testimony and some of the exchanges uh, on uh, the, the television in our office. And there was one exchange in particular that was a bit uh, interesting to me. And so I want to, and I, I had noticed that, Mr. Danson, uh, you didn't have an opportunity to really respond to the, the question that was being posed by uh, the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. McClintock. And so I, I'd like to go back to the point that he made about the toothpaste. Um, in 1984, how old were you, Mr. Danson? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're, if you're comfortable sharing it, of course. I don't want to. Tough question. I was born in 47. Would you do the math for me? <laughs> Thank you. I am a lawyer, not a mathematician, unfortunately. But I believe uh, that that would put you at, uh, what, 50, 84, 34? Sounds uh, right. What was that? 43. I think that's right. No, 47. In 1984, when you were 43, what 43. kind of? 43. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm old. Go on. That's all right. Yeah, I don't want to get stuck on your age, Mr. Danson. Uh, what you kind that. of car were you? What, what kind of car were you driving, Mr. Danson, back in the 1980s? 1980s. Yeah. Woof. Uh, Ford Explorer <laughs> Ford, for a while. And I, I take it it probably wasn't an electric car, right? No, but I did have the first EV1. All right. And I, uh, I suspect, uh, you know, you might have been renting back then, or, or you owned a home. Did your home have solar it panels was, back then? No, they did not. No, and my point is this, the reason why I ask, I was born in 1984, uh, I'm 35 today. I have a daughter who's 14 months old, and I think a lot about the world that she will inherit. And much of the work we do here in this committee and in this Congress is about fighting to make sure that the world she inherits is a better one than we did. The transformative changes that have happened just in the last 35 years since I was born have been dramatic, right? And you have chosen, amongst many other uh, citizens in our country, uh, and of course several of the panelists here, to m try to make a difference, to adopt strategies in your own life and the way in which uh, you uh, conduct yourself to be environmentally conscious, and of course taking advantage of the technological capabilities that have also changed. So this notion that uh, we can't adapt, that removing microplastics, suddenly we, will, we all will be amiss with the realities of trying to replace uh, the plastic tube that carries toothpaste to me, is a false choice. Fundamentally, we all collectively are going to have to adopt strategies that enable us to move into a future in which microplastics are not polluting our planet and in the communities that we are also lucky to call home. That, to me, is what this hearing should collectively be about. So to the extent, Mr. Danson, that you'd care to respond further, I know you did talk a little bit about some of the alternatives to uh, toothpaste um, uh, containers and toothpaste brushes um, that uh, are non-plastic options. But uh, if you care to, to also illuminate further or expound well, I, further Just on briefly, point. I do know that people will invent new things and create more jobs and, and not create stuff that is worse for the climate. But just in general, if you're talking about your children, then you're talking about climate change. You just are, and you're talking about uh, greenhouse gases. And if you're talking about greenhouse gases and we're in the middle of a committee about pl ocean plastic, you have to acknowledge that the plastic is coming from petroleum and chemicals, and that lifespan from the time of production to it lying on a beach is the equivalent, all of the plastic, as the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases. So if you want to take care of your children, you have to stop, start addressing these incredibly inconvenient things that we have all gotten used to and, uh, and enjoy, but they're no longer good for us, and they're going to land on our children and our grandchildren in a huge way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the balance of my time. and. Uh, apologize to Mr. Danson for revealing his age. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, yield back. How old are you? 35. Uh, all right. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the, the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. I found this very interesting. Uh, the members of the committee may wish to have some additional questions for the witnesses and we're going to ask you to respond to these in writing. 
Uh, under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for, this, for their responses. Just before I uh, end, uh, I want to introduce into the record a journal article from the journal volume nine of the Nature Climate Change of 2019 which uh, was a study that showed that the, glo the global life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from conventional plastics, which were produced in 2015, were 1.8 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. This is approximately the annual emissions, as I pointed out in my introduction, of 462 coal-fired power plants. That's what we're just talking about in terms of CO2 emissions. I want to get that formally into the Chair, record. I'm wondering yes. whose time are you speaking on? Well, I'm, to I'm, the I'm round of questions. If we are, I'm prepared to engage. No, it. I'm just introducing uh, something into the record. And there is no so, objection. So, thank you. Uh, if there's no further business, without objection, this committee stands adjourned. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. No.